Welcome, everybody. All right. So today we're talking about the Holy Spirit, right? We are on our third part in this series, I think it is, on the Christian faith. Um, and I want to begin by reading a Bible verse to you. Even before we pray, I want to read this to you. All right? I'm going to read it, but you read it to yourself too. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Why do I read this to you? Because your flesh, right now, like now, doesn't want you to pay attention to me. Well, not me. Don't pay attention to me, all right? But, but to the Holy Spirit speaking through me, amen? Your flesh, I will promise you right now, wants to do everything in its power to distract you, to make you not pay attention, to make you think about something you should be think, shouldn't be thinking about. And it's very innocent. What am I going to have for lunch later? Everything or anything that can make you not want to pay attention. All right? And the only way that you can defeat the flesh, and we're going to talk about this, is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says, walk by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit, what that means is being, allow, allow the Holy Spirit to influence you, to, to, to pattern your life, all right? And not just in the, long, uh, uh, in the long run, but even now, like in these, you know, in this one hour that you're here. Amen? Amen. All right. So that's why I say this because, listen, you have, you always have, listen to this, you always have God's undivided attention, always. There's never a moment when you go into his presence, right, with a humble and a contrite heart that he will despise you. Never. Ever. So you have his undivided attention. So give him your undivided attention right now. All right? He promises, I'm just going to read this, Jeremiah 33, 3. This is a verse you should know by heart. Um, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. But there's an action that you got to take. You got to call on him, right? But he promises to answer you, all right? And the calling is not just pray, it's not just going to him in prayer, but even now saying as we pray, God, speak to me today. He will answer that, all right? You're not praying for a million dollars or for a new Lamborghini. You're praying for something according to his will. God wants you to listen to him. Pray to him now as we pray, God, help me to not be distracted. To, If I'm hungry, Lord, quiet that hunger pain. <laughs> if I'm in pain because I, I slammed my finger the other day, Lord, take that pain away for at least this one hour. God, anything and everything that you can, my God, my friend that's bothering me, please help me to not be distracted. The girl that I like, the boy that I like, Please make him look ugly just for today. Whatever it is, but I need to pay attention, my God. Amen? Do you get me? All right. Because your flesh is desperate. Your heart is desperate to not want God. Okay? All right. So with that said, let's stand up and let's pray real quick. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity once again that you've given us every single one in here my God to know you more my God you desire us to know you my God and for that reason Lord we, we've begun this series my God about what our faith is what we believe my God we don't want to have a, a superficial understanding of what we believe my God we want to grow deeper in your love my God we want to know you my God despite how our flesh feels right now and despite If I don't want to be here right now or if I don't feel it right now, my God, I'm asking you, God, to <laughs> help me be focused now, my God, in everything that you're going to speak to me today, my God. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would use me, my God. Use me as your mouthpiece. Use me as a vessel and only as a vessel, my God. I don't want to say anything that is not yours, my God. Use me today, my God. In the name of Jesus, glorify your name, my God. Amen. 
Amen. All right. So let's begin with a simple question. Okay? Is this. Who is or what is the Holy Spirit? Third person of the Trinity. Anybody else? Who is the Holy Spirit? Or Jesus, okay? You can also tell me some of the things that you've heard that you know are wrong. I mean, just tell me. Who do you think he is or who, who he isn't? A thing that guides you to the right path. A person, all right? He's a person, all right? Listen, ra- okay, this is pretty dumb, but I hope it proves the point. Raise your hand if you're a person. Josh, you better raise your hand, unless you're some alien, all right? <laughs> okay, you know who didn't raise his hand? Well, I didn't, oh, I'll raise my hand too. You know who didn't raise his hand? He didn't raise his hand. Why? Because it's a water bottle, and water bottles don't have hands, all right? All right? Water bottles don't get upset if I drop them. He's not happy because I picked them up right now, right? It's a water bottle. It doesn't have feelings, emotions, or desires. It's a bottle. It does nothing. If I break him, are you going to be upset? No. Is he going to cry because he's dead? No. He has no life. He's a water bottle. He's a thing, okay? He's a thing, okay? The Holy Spirit is not a thing. It's not a force, all right? It's not... Some, some uh, spiritual thing, you know, like a lot of the New Age stuff, um, people talk about, you know, this, this force within us, within us that helps us to talk to God. It's, it's nonsense, all right? It's so impersonal, right? The Holy Spirit is a person. That's the first thing I want you to know. And yes, the Holy Spirit is God. Two things. The Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy Spirit is a person. If he's a person, what does that mean? That he has emotions, he has a mind, he has a will, a desire, a personality, right? Amen? He has a life. He's omniscient. He's eternal. He's omnipresent. He's your counselor. He's your helper. He's your friend. All of these things. None of those qualities can be defined by a thing. You know, this water bottle can't comfort me. I mean, you could say maybe when I drink it, I guess. Um, It's not omnipresent, all right? It can't talk to me, right? The Holy Spirit is not something, it's not a force. A force can't comfort you. A, a, a force doesn't, ha- it, it's not omniscient. It doesn't know something, right? That's why the Holy Spirit is a person. Amen? You guys can say amen if you want. Amen, amen. All right. The Holy Spirit is God. Okay? John 14, 16 says, if you have your Bible, uh, open up to John 14, 16. I think I have that verse here. Yes. No, not that one. That's fine. You, go, you, you, you could use it. Yeah, you could use it. John 14, 16. If you don't have your Bible, it's fine. Just look up at the board. It says, and I will ask, this is Jesus talking, okay? Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Okay? So the Holy Spirit is God. All right? How do we know that by, by reading this verse? another, right? This is Jesus talking, right? And he's saying, I'm going to give you another helper. You know what the word another means in Greek? Or the original? It's another of the same kind. It's not like another uh, thing different. No, no. Another of the same kind. Um, Let's read, uh, for this I need a Bible. Let me get that Bible. Acts 5. Sorry. Let's go to Acts 5 chapter, I mean, Acts chapter 5. Verses 1 through 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts is between Genesis and Revelation. Uh. (laughs) I got it, I got it. All right, Acts chapter 5. Verses 1 through 5. Okay, I'm going to read. It says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, Sapphira, I may be pronouncing this wrong, but Sapphira, 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 also sold a piece of property. 
With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. Not good. But brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied, ju you have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Okay, I don't know if you caught that, all right? And there, Peter is saying, he first tells Ananias, like, you lied to the Holy Spirit. And then later he tells him, you lied to God. He's connecting the Holy Spirit with God. It's one and the same, all right? And Ananias, as you know, because he lied, he lied dead <laughs> on the floor, all right? Both of them, Ananias and Sapphira, because they lied. They, nobody caught that? They lied, so they lied on the floor. Okay. All right, let's keep going. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> because he's a person, listen, because the Holy Spirit is a person, all right, the Bible tells us two things. He cannot be, or not he cannot, well, he can be, I'm sorry, he can be grieved, and his activity within us can be quenched, okay? So now what does that mean? The Bible says, Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All right, like I said before, I can't grieve this water bottle because I dropped it, okay? It, it doesn't make sense, right? He's a person. He can be grieved. He has emotions. Now, his grieve, all right, it doesn't lead him toward, toward depression or something. It's not a sinful type of sadness, all right, like it can happen with us, all right? He's just sad that, the, the temple, which you are, which, where he dwells, has chosen to keep sin unconfessed in their heart. So that saddens him, all right? So you can grieve the Holy Spirit, cause emotional pain to the Holy Spirit. And you do this, you guys can even throw me some examples, all right? You do this when you're unforgiving. You do this when you're hating when you're fighting, when you're not getting along with your brother or sister, right? Um, when, I'll, I'll give you this one, because I think this is very uh, kind of prevalent within youth a little bit more. When you show partiality or favoritism. Now, what does that mean? You're looking at me like, what do you mean? When you're very biased, when, you know, you have friends. And it's, listen, you don't need to be friends with everybody. That's just crazy. I'm not friends with everybody. But you, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we see it, I, I've seen it ever since I've been a youth, all right? Where everybody that knows each other, knows each other, but when you got a couple of new, you know, youth that come to church, maybe they're, they talk funny, they look funny, they act funny, they smell funny, or maybe, <laughs> or maybe none of that, maybe you just don't know them, and you just, you just can't chill with them, so you just don't want to talk to them. So you show favoritism. You're, you're, you're more cool. You, you are, you're nice to the ones to your clique, but you don't want to be nice to them. The, this is a command, all right? It's a sin to do that. It's clear. You know why? Because God didn't do it with you, right? God didn't say, well, there goes uh, Josh. You know, I don't like the way he looks. I'm not dying for him. God didn't show favoritism, right? <laughs> Amen? I'm, I'm sorry, that was a little uh, off tangent, but I had to say that, all right? I had to say that because I, you see that a lot. You know, we talk about sin, but there's certain things that are more prevalent with, in, you know, in your generation, right? In your age, okay? So do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians six nineteen. I think I have that here. All right. The Holy Spirit is a person. I'm going to repeat this forever. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he cannot stand the presence of sin. Right? And he hates sin. And he hates it when it's... You are the dwelling place. All right? And you're not... 
if you read this verse, let's just read it. It says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your body ain't yours. I know that sounds weird. All right? You were purchased. You were redeemed. We've talked about redemption a few weeks ago. Right? And it doesn't say your body is the house of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say your body is the apartment building of the Holy Spirit. It says your body is the temple. It's sacred to him. He wants it separated for him. So when there's, we all sin, all right? But the Holy Spirit is there also. We're going to talk about that too, about Holy Spirit is in you to convict you of sin and to take you to, to point you to Christ, to point you to the cross, to lead you to a repentance, all right? So he wants that cleansing always to be occurring. He doesn't want you to be sitting there with sin. If I got a, I wish I could do this, but I might get in trouble if I ever did. Get a bunch of cow manure and just leave it here while I keep talking. All right? And just leave it here. A bunch of, like a pile of cow dung and just leave it piled up in here while I keep talking. Look, even the thought of it makes you guys say eelk. All right? Even just the thought about... Uh, <laughs> now, but look, if it was here, it wouldn't just be a thought, right? You'd feel it. You'd smell it. You'd sense it. You'd have a react... Thank you, my friend. You'd have a reaction to it. All right? Sin is much worse than that. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, I believe, it says, The Lord detests lying lips. He detests it. He detests sin. It's like leaving that there. You know, sometimes that's what we do, right? We leave that cow dung in there, but we go around and we, we take the dust out of the, the windows. We put some Windex on the, on the table. All the while, that sin is just there. All right? And the Holy Spirit is telling you, bro, clean your temple. This does not belong there. Right? So you can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible also says that because he's a person, right, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. But it also says, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? All right, quench is kind of what you think it means, right? When you quench something, it's like you have a fire and you quench it, you throw water at it, you stop it, okay? So the Spirit of God in you is like a fire that, whose flame we don't want to quench, why? Because the purpose of him is, is, is he's like a consuming fire. He wants to consume the, the caca. <laughs> he wants to consume everything in your, in, your, in your heart that does not belong. And when you quench it, you're saying, essentially this is what you're saying. You're saying, you know, Holy Spirit, ah, no, not that. Don't change me. Not, not there. Don't touch that part of me. No, 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 no. Relax. That, that's enough. That's you quenching the Holy Spirit. And you do that when you, when you decide to not obey his leading, his voice, and just go about doing what you feel like you should do. And that could be anything from killing somebody to simply distracting somebody in class. All right? But exactly, it's a sin. What I mean is sin in general, any sphere within there. All right? Listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Amen? Be very sensitive to his voice. So we can quench the Holy Spirit. And think about it like this. If you keep that analogy, right? When we read the Word of God, when we pray, it's kind of like you're adding wood to the fire. You want to keep the fire burning, right? You've heard that expression before, right? So that's why the Holy Spirit, right, His work in our lives is like a fire burning in us, but we got to keep that fire burning. we got to listen to His voice. we got to read the Word. Right? We've got to obey the word, not just be hearers, but doers of the word. Amen? All right. So, Holy Spirit is a person. He's God. All right? And because he's a person, he can be grieved. All right? And the Bible also commands us not to quench the Holy Spirit. Let's read Ephesians 5.18. That's not Ephesians 5.18. Ephesians 5.18, I have it here. Okay. It says, Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Okay? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, we've heard that expression, right? Everybody's heard the expression, oh, let's be, you know, be filled. You've heard it in prayer. You've heard it. You've read it. You've heard us. Amen. You, you've heard us talk about it. Now, being filled, what, how do you know? How do you know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, God, how do you know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes, yeah, just, huh? Your actions, very good. So your, your fruit will speak a lot <laughs> as to if you're filled, because if you're filled with the Spirit of God, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives off fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I know that only because of a song. I don't think I'm that good. All right, it's a little kid song, so I know it because of that. But yes, you're right. We know that we're filled because of the fruits. I know that you're filled because I see the fruits in you, okay? But there's a difference. Look, there's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit, all right? If you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit with you, all right? All right? Now, but look, listen. John 14, 16. It says that, oh, the, the same uh, verse where, where it talks about that, uh, where Jesus says that he, uh, he will give another, he will send another helper. He says, and he will be with you always, meaning forever. He's, the Holy Spirit is with you. Once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he is with you. He indwells you. Now, does he control you? Does he, is he, are you filled with him? It's a totally different thing. All right. Well, when I say I want the filling of the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying, you know, I want a little bit more of Holy Spirit. No, you have all the Holy Spirit you need. The question is, is he controlling every part of you? Okay. Is he controlling all of you? Is he controlling all of your mind, all of your heart, the depths of your heart, every desire? Is he control? Are you giving yourself completely to him? Okay. That's the question. There's the, all right. So he's in you, but is he are you walking with him? Are you, are you allowing him to control you, to guide you, okay? Remember when we spoke about the Beatitudes, if you were here, and we spoke about blessed are the meek? Who can tell me? Well, come on, meek. What is meekness? Come on. Pop quiz. Let's go. Sin? Bro, sin? Oh, hint. No, he knows. No, that was the one before. Bless are those who mourn. Meek. All right, I'll give you. A, no. All right, I'll give you. I'll give you a clue. A horse. Mm, kinda. Almost obedience. Come on. Tamed. It's power under control. All right. Power under control. All right. Yeah, is that tame is pretty close. Okay. So, blessed are the meek. The Bible says blessed are the meek. You know why? Because we have power to, to disobey the Holy Spirit's voice. We have power to quench the Holy Spirit. We have power to grieve the Holy Spirit. But what God is saying, blessed are the meek. Blessed are you who allow your power to be under his control. You got that? So, you may have the Holy Spirit, but you may not be allowing him to move in your life. All right? And it's not just outward, all right? Joseph said, by your fruits, yes. But it's also internally, you know, if you're filled by the Holy Spirit. Um, it's not just by your outward actions, but it's also by your inner thoughts, right? Your inner desires, do they agree with his? Listen to what Psalm 19:14 says. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. All right? So it's not just what you say and how you act, but it's how you think and how you feel and how, and how uh, your heart is, right? That points to you being filled with the Holy Spirit. Rule number one, you cannot be filled if you have unconfessed sin in your heart, right? If you're, if you're walk, walking around with unconfessed sin, okay, and you don't do nothing about it, and you're not repentant of it, and you just don't care about it, the Holy Spirit, he may be in you, but he's not in control of you. Because if he was, he w what he does is lead you to, toward repentance, and obviously you're not doing that, so he's not in control. All right? How do we maintain the feeling? 
obedience, obedience to his voice. Obedience to, to the voice of the Holy Spirit is how we maintain his filling in our lives, his control in our lives. So now, while it's true that the Holy Spirit will never leave us, the benefits of his presence, okay, can depart from us, all right? If you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm saying it again, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. But the benefits of his presence may not because you're quenching his, his activity in your life. You're saying, all right, Holy Spirit, and you hear him, you know you do. You know the truth. You know that you do. You feel the Holy Spirit when you're about to uh, cheat on that test, but you're saying, but come on, God. I mean, everybody else did it, and he just passed me the cheat cheat. Like, what am I supposed to do right now? Like, right? All right? And maybe there's many other examples I could think of, but we don't have time. And you guys know them. I don't got to give them to you. All right? You feel the voice of the Holy Spirit in you, nudging you, tugging at you, telling you, not a good idea. But you quench him. That's you quenching him, by the way, okay? Those moments are you suppressing him and saying, I hear you, but, oh, this is more pleasurable at the moment. So what does the Holy Spirit desire to do in your life? Let's talk about that. Perfect. He points you to Christ. He will always point you to Christ, to, to, uh, to repentance, right, like I keep saying. All right, but we're going we're gonna to break it down more, right? There's a lot of, we, we can't possibly do this in one class, okay? There's, there's a lot that the Holy Spirit does. But I want to start with this. Ephesians 1, verse 13 through 14. All right? This is, once you read it, you may not understand it, but remember what we said at the beginning. We prayed about this, okay? Don't let the flesh conquer right now, all right? I'm giving you a little reminder. All right, remind your flesh. I want everybody right now to just say, to make a little prayer in your mind right now and, and remind your flesh that you're going to pay attention right now. Please do that, all right? Because it's, your flesh don't grow tired. The enemy does not grow weak, all right? 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, the enemy roars around like a lion looking to who he may devour. So he's looking for moments of weakness. He's looking for the moment where you're going to just talk to your friend again or say, you know what, I'm, oh man, okay, Danny's talking some, some good stuff, but you know what, right now I'm a little bit tired. I'm just going to kind of, hmm. Okay? Maybe you're thirsty. <laughs> Maybe you're hungry right now. All right? Quiet your flesh. All right? When you need to pray, I don't, listen, prayer, when I tell you pray really quick, you don't have to come here, bow down, and, and kneel. You don't even have to talk really loud, all right? You know the Bible says to pray without ceasing? You know what that means? To never stop praying. How can you possibly never stop praying? All right? Can you, be, can you bow down while you're at work or while you're at school? Can you, like, raise your hands and close your eyes while you're driving? Uh, no, I wouldn't. All right? Okay? When the Bible says pray without ceasing, you know what that means? All right? You don't, look, going on your knees, bowing your head, closing your eyes, raising your hands, even speaking audibly, they're all just customs of prayer, all right? It's things that we do when we pray, but prayer in its essence is just communicating with God, okay? Because if all that were true, if all that were true, then people that are deaf, they wouldn't be able to pray, right? So you always have an opportunity to pray to God. Even in school, while you're taking a test, just, you know, you don't have to even close your eyes. You just meditate on, on God and say, God, help me right now. So that's what I'm telling you. When you feel like you're about to yawn for the third time right now, ask God, God, help me. Because I know I need to hear this. Amen? All right, so let's read this once again. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, it says, In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. What's the key word there? Yes. Actually, I wasn't even thinking of that, but yes, that's even more of the key word. But what's the second key word? Sealed. Promise. All right. What's the third key word? Sealed. sealed. Who said with? All right, relax. Sealed. We're sealed. All right, now what does that mean? Well, let me keep reading it. 
We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now that sounds really cool. That sounds like it means a lot. But what does it mean? What does it mean that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit? All right. It's like an envelope pretty much, right? So it's, you know, in ancient times, right? You probably know this from watching movies and stuff, right? They would use wax, right? And if, if they needed to, bro, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have telegrams. I mean, they didn't have nothing. They had some guy who was a messenger, all right? And that was his job. If they needed to send the message from Egypt to, uh, I don't know, America. Oh, not America. I don't know. To somewhere from Jerusalem to Judea. Bethlehem, thank you. <laughs> if they needed to do that, right? The... the you went to Israel, you know better. He did, yeah. Anyways, let's get back, let's get back, listen. What would they do? What would they do, though? Guys, what would they do? They would get a letter, they put wax on it, and then they would stamp it, right, with the seal of the king. The king would have a, a ring, an insignant, insignant, right? So they would know where this is coming from, who this is coming from, Right? And how important it is, it would give it, it, it would give, the seal would determine how important it is. It was, if it was from a king or from a, like a, the governor or whatever, there's a big difference, right? All right, but if it had the, 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 the initials of the king, okay? Okay, but now look, I want you to think about a seal. What does a seal do? Holds it together. All right, I want, okay, let's, let's think of this, for example. Not the juice, oh, man. I'm going I'm to read you what it says in the back. And you guys all know this. It says, do not consume if inner seal is torn or missing. Oh, so if you, oh, man. It, I wouldn't trust it. You know why? Because you don't know. Let me ask you a question. Okay, let me just ask you that question. If I open this up and that seal is not there or is broken or has a little, somebody poked it, right? W would you drink it? No. It may be perfectly fine. It may really be. But how do you know? Right? How do you know? Why wouldn't you drink it? No. Because it has a hole in it. Okay. If the seal is broken, why wouldn't you consume it? Somebody tampered with it? You, you wanted to say something? Right? But, but that, that's what it is, basically. Somebody tampered with it. Somebody did something to it. So a seal provides protection, right? Security. It authenticates, right? It makes this authentic. If I had two of these, one didn't have a seal, one had a seal, this would be more authentic, right? This would be more like the real thing, right? And it also shows ownership or possession. Now, why would you think that God would say you are sealed with the Holy Spirit? Amen. Right? Oh, very good. That's one reason. And also protection, right? God wants to protect what's inside. When they made this in the plant, all right, and they squeezed the oranges and they took their time and they did that, it passed quality inspection, all of that. And if somebody just comes and they just poke it and they put like, I don't know, some chemical in it or something else to, to poison you, it, it completely corrupted everything that was done, right? It's not orange juice no more, it's poison, right? So in the same way, the Holy Spirit seals us to protect us, right? It authenticates us. And like uh, Caitlin said, it shows ownership, possession. Now, Yes, authenticate. So, listen. The devil knows, all right? The devil knows who is authentic, okay? The devil knows who's for real, okay? If you guys go around trying to preach the gospel and you're not living it, the devil knows. If you're trying to, uh, to pray to God but 
you're not practicing it, the devil knows who's authentic. Okay? He knows the word better than you do. Okay? You don't, you don't scare the devil by quoting scripture. You don't. You know how you resist the devil and have him flee? You can say in the name of Jesus. That, that won't do nothing. Because if, if, if you're not authentic, he'll know that means nothing to him. He knows who's truly filled with the Holy Spirit or just filled with something else because they've been tampered with by him, right? Again, you can quote scripture all you want. That don't make the devil flee. What makes the devil flee is when you obey scripture. Huge difference. When, you, when the devil sees you obeying what the Holy Spirit says, he will flee. Do you know why? Because when you obey the Holy Spirit, you're moving toward God. It's like a shepherd who's calling his sheep. And they hear his voice and they run to him. Now you're, in, now you're secure. Now he can't touch you. Now he will flee. But you can quote Bible all you want. He'll, he'll quote it right back to you. No matter. Don't have a Bible fight with him. He knows it better than you. Live it. All right? Live it. So he knows who's authentic. Similarly, security, protection, right? Now, what kind of security are we talking about? How does, how does, the, how does the Holy Spirit secure us or protect us from the world? But hey, there's a lot of sick Christians out there. I mean, physically sick, right? I mean, there's a lot of Christians that are suffering. Okay, in what way, though? I'm going to read you these verses so you kind of understand. Look. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things, I'm going to stop there, all things. You know what all things mean? Everything, good or bad things. All right? Now, with that in mind, read it again. And we know that in all things, good and bad, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Which means that even if you're going through some stuff, God promises that it will work out for your ultimate good. And that cannot change. That cannot be tampered with. That cannot be uh, manipulated by the enemy. All right? In no way. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon forged against you will prosper. You know that. Listen, for as long, this is something I received a long time ago. You're literally immortal. Now, not just forever, but if God has a purpose in your life, nobody can touch you. Nobody. Not the devil, not a gun in your head, I mean, nobody. All right? God will protect you until your purpose is fulfilled in your life. That's a promise of God, all right? So he protects you. And ownership, possession. What, listen, whatever, whatever's in your heart is what has ownership of it. So if it's all self, well, then you control yourself. If it's the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is in possession. So remember what we said? That the seal has a sign of the 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 sign of the king, right? Or the or, or it marked where it was coming from, right? Kind of like in a letter or, or so forth. It always had an identification, so they know who this is coming from, right? Or who it is. My question to you is, you know, whose image, whose insignia, or if I'm saying it right, whose image is on you? Whose image is on your heart? Whose seal is on your heart? I know that's what you want to say, but is that what it really is, right? Because let's, let's read this verse again. Look, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, look at the, act, the, the verbs, right? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, 
we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So who are those that are sealed? Those who believed, those who not just heard, but those who believed, all right? So my question to you is, have you heard and believed? Now, what exactly does that mean, right? Because we all hear stuff. You all are hearing me right now. You all have heard the word of God being preached and taught. But let me tell you something. Have you ever heard maybe near your house, like construction work being done? You know that big, uh, what do you call that thing? That drill? It's really loud, that jackhammer. Thank you, jackhammer. Listen, eventually, you just get numb to it. Like if they're working on it for like five days, you're like, oh, oh, that's that noise. Okay. You still hear it, but you eventually you're just like, oh, okay. You tune it out, right? You get numb to it. And it's true with other things, right? You just get numb to it. Is that how you're hearing? Right? Or maybe uh, it's just an emotional type of hearing, right? You hear when, you, when, you, when it feels right, right? That's why the Bible says it's not just that you heard, but that you believed. You know what the word believe means, right? It says, it's the, it's the Greek word pisteo, which means to be convinced of something or to give authority to. That's the type of belief. When you have given authority to, when you've believed in the Holy Spirit, that's when you're sealed. Okay? So it's for those who have believed. Amen. So we, we talked about the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin. That's another one of his, uh, his jobs. He comforts us. Uh, he sanctifies us. Uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, The Spirit sets himself against the desires of the flesh and leads the believer into righteousness. This is what we read at the beginning. The works of the flesh become less evident and the fruit of the Spirit becomes more evident. Okay? His job in your life is to continue to make you more like Christ daily in every situation. So I wonder if you ever question yourself, you know, and you ask yourself, you know, oh, I can't. I just can't overcome my flesh. I can't. Um, I want to honor God, but it's, it's too hard, right? Well, let me tell you something. It's not, <laughs> number one, you're not alone. All right, everybody asks that, but this is why it's so important to understand the job of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one that will comfort you, will sanctify you, will convict you of sin. He's the one that searches your heart, all right, and leads you toward repentance, right? And, and let's uh, read this, John 14, 15 through 16. It says, Remember when Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands, right? That's a very strong comment, to, I mean, a command to give, right? Like, it's a lot of, I mean, it's very hard to live up to the standard that Jesus put, right? That's why it's, yeah, it's hard to be a Christian sometimes. And Jesus says, well, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And like it says in there, if you love me, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Do you really think that you could do that on your own? Do you really think that you can obey the commands of God on your own? So stop thinking that you can. Stop beating yourself up because you, you can't. Because you won't. You never will. That's why he gave us the helper. He's our helper, right? Right after Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. You know what he says? And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. All right? He helps you. He guides you. And as he sanctifies you, he produces fruit. Right? Through the word of God. He guides you. Like another thing is, uh, maybe you ask yourself as a Christian, you know, I don't understand the word of God. You know, where do I start? Like, what do I do? Like, do I start in Genesis? Do I start in Matthew? I like, what do I do? Do I do a devotional? Like, I don't know. How do I start reading the Bible? Just start reading the Bible. Because from there, whether you start at Genesis or Matthew, it does not matter. Okay? The Holy Spirit promises he guides us. All right? Guides us to all truth. And he guides us in his word. Right? He, he illuminates the word of God to us. He enables us to understand it, to interpret it. 
It's not your job to understand the word of God because you won't. You, your reliance on the Holy Spirit has to be complete. You're not able to understand the word of God. You need the Holy Spirit to understand it. Amen? And the Holy Spirit empowers us. Okay? Do you really think, honestly, think about this for a second. Do you really think that I, Danny, can stand here by my own strength and teach you about surrendering your life to Christ? And... Um, obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit, and reading your word daily. Do you think that I have the power to do that? Like, really? No, nah, man. I don't. You know why? Because sometimes I don't. It's not me. I don't have the power. The Holy Spirit is the one that empowers you. So if you have a brother or a sister, and, or literally a brother or a sister, or you're at work, at school, he won't empower you to evangelize to live the life so people can see Christ in you, okay? It's not you. You won't be able to. So daily is when we got to ask, Holy Spirit, guide my thoughts, guide my steps. I want to walk with you daily. I want to be influenced by you daily. And we can talk about a lot of these, but, uh, you know, he's, he's the one that gives you gifts, right? He's, uh, he produces fruit in you. And... Uh, but all of these, what I want you to know is this. All, everything that he does, is it possible that a force could do that? Is it possible that a thing could do that? That's something that a person will do. He can't, only a person can comfort you. Only a person can, can, can influence you, right? So my question to, to close is this. Is this type of life, this Holy Spirit-filled life, is this something for you? Is this something that you want? Because if you want to be filled, you have all the Holy Spirit you need. The question is, how much do you want to surrender or yield control? Okay? Do you really? I mean, it's what's more important, like, right now, what's more important? What's more important? Is, your, is, is what your flesh telling you more important right now? Is the distraction in your mind, the thoughts that you're thinking right now more important? Or is maybe the thought that I do need to surrender more to him more important? Amen. So because if, if you really want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he wants all of you. He doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. And he wants all of you because what he wants for you is better than what you can want for yourself. Okay? He wants all of you. I mean, are you ready for that? Are you ready for God to be the, the Lord of your life? The master in your life? Directing you? Telling you what to do and what not to do? Are you ready for that? Because if you're not, this ain't for you. Okay? This is something I want you guys to no, know. Listen, I want you guys to answer within yourself. Don't answer it out loud. I don't need to hear it. This is... These are questions you need to answer within yourself, okay? Think about it. Do you want him to be the Lord of your life? You should obviously want him. There's a lot of people that think that yeah, I'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I do need God, but uh, you procrastinate, right? You'll say, you know, tomorrow. And I think I've said this to you guys before, right? It's, you know, yesterday I said tomorrow, right? That whole thing. How many times are you going to say that? Do you know that the, the enemy's greatest skill is, or one of his greatest skills is spiritual procrastination? You guys, hey, this is the devil telling you, like, Josh, you, you could be holy. You need to be holy, Josh. But just do it tomorrow. Just do it tomorrow. Right now, you got a lot of things in your mind. You could be holy, but not now. You're too tired right now. You're too worried right now. There's other things that right now are in your mind that they need to take precedence over this idea of holiness. Do it tomorrow. There's a chance tomorrow. 
or next week during that conference, that's going to be a nice day to do it because, oh, man, it's going to be, it's going to be you know, a lot of people there. Spiritual procrastination. Tomorrow's not promised. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, present your body, your mind, your personality, your spirit, your desires, everything. Present it to him today. And don't resist his voice. Amen? Let's, um, let me see. I think I have one more verse in here. Ah, wait. Oh, this one, yes. It says, this is Proverbs fourteen twelve. It says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Okay? <laughs> yeah, you might find the way out of there, but uh, spiritually speaking, I don't think you will. It will lead to death. Whatever you think is right, you, 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 you think it's right, will eventually lead to death. Everybody will physically die. There's no question about that. But the death we're talking about here is a little bit more important than physical death. Right? We're talking about eternal separation from the Father. If you keep doing you and not allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you, you will end up in eternal separation from God. Right? It's very simple. And the Bible says that way that you think, it seems right. It's not that it seems wrong. Oh, like I'm going to go and murder people. No, it seems right. It feels right. It looks right. But it don't, it don't end up right. <laughs> Let's listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. Amen. So with that, guys, let's get up. Let's close in prayer. Through the Holy Spirit. That's right. <laughs> Amen. So listen, listen, guys, look, you guys are not 12. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. Okay. <laughs> you're not. You're not. All right. I'm going to pray for you but I want you guys to pray this individually. Remember how we began, all right? You can let your flesh control you right now. You literally can get up on top of a chair and start screaming because that's what you want your flesh to do. That's fine. You can do that. No, please don't do that. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, take this moment and ask God, if the first thing you got to say out of your mouth is say, God, I don't feel like talking to you right now. Well, then say that at the very least. Because God honors that. You're not scaring God. You're not, you're not offending God by saying that. You're actually making him happy that you're actually at least speaking to him. Because he's always open to hear you. At least begin there. And ask him to start taking control. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to control you, to possess you, to completely Give, to, to give yourself away completely to him. Amen? My God, we, we're here, and we ask you, Lord, we present our hearts to you, my God, just the way they are, my God. You're a God that heals the broken. You bind up their wounds. And my God, we present to you our hearts, my God. You know each and every heart here. You know how it is right now, my God. You know the condition of it, my God. We pray that your spirit, my God, would ignite a fire in us, my God, consume us completely, my God, so that we, we, we may be only, only consumed with knowing you more, my God, only ready to hear more about you, my God. Consume all those other wants, all those other desires, all those other areas in our lives, my God, that are just sucking the life out of us, my God, and, and those, those, those wells, my God, that we're running to that are just dry, my God. Holy Spirit of God, lead us back to the cross, my God, to where we need to be, my God, to the feet of the cross, my God. Lead us back, my God. I pray, my God, in the name of Jesus for everybody here, my God, that you would open up hearts, my God, that you would 
break hearts, my God. That you would allow everyone here, my God, to be guided by you, to be strengthened by you, to be sanctified by your spirit, to be convicted of sin, to run to the cross when they feel your spirit convicting them of wrong, that they would obey your voice, my God, just like a a sheep hears and knows the voice of the shepherd, my God. They they would discern, discern your voice clearly, my God, above all the other lies and deceptions, my God, that are out there, my God. Above all the, all the, all the other offer, offers, my God, that this world has to give, my God, we pray, my God, that your voice would be loud and clear, my God. That we would yield to your, to your Spirit's leading and to your Spirit's voice, my God. We pray in the name of Jesus, my God. I pray against every feeling of indifference, my God. Every feeling that the flesh wants to rise up against, my God. Your Spirit, my God, working in their lives, my God. Lord, I pray your spirit would come like a fire, my God, and consume every part of our being, my God. Fill them up with your spirit, my God. Fill them up with your influence, with your character, with your your presence, my God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.